Hi, Lenora. Hi, how are you? Doing very good. It's so very lovely to see you. And thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. I know you're swamped and you have lots and lots of meetings uh, on your schedule this month. Well, um, the good news is I am extraordinarily busy. The sad news is the reason why I'm extraordinarily busy. And that's you know due to the current events uh, happening in our country and in fact around the world. It is very, very heartwarming to see the protest around the world in support of um, the racism that is rampant here in the United States, but um, we don't own it. It really is uh, worldwide. So it's it's um, very heartening to see other people supporting us. And so I'm busy because my clients, my colleagues, my friends are all calling, um, either wanting uh, coaching, advice, listening, you know, have me listen to them or actually make some uh, virtual presentations or lead virtual conversations. I'm not the authority on it, but I certainly can speak from my experience. And because I've been um, doing work in the area of diversity, inclusion, equity, racism, sexism, homophobia, all of those kind of things, I've been doing work in that space for over 25 years. I've had my own firm for um, 34 years now and uh, just really focused on the DNI space a little over 25 years ago because of things that happened to me personally. In any case though, um, really the disconnect or the misunderstanding that people have is that people think that there are different races. The fact of the matter is there's only one. It's called the human race. And I'm not just, you know, like saying that because it sounds good. Scientifically, there is no such thing as different races. Uh, our skin color is different based on where our ancestors migrated to. However, there is such a thing as racism. Race, the way we use it, when we say black people, white people, that kind of thing, um, the way we use it is a social construct. And it really came about in the 1600s and frankly, uh, a bit even before that, when the conquerors, the many uh, of them that there were, but the conquerors happened to be white Europeans and they needed a way to justify having people of black skin held as slaves. So one way to do that and to really get their entire society at the time to buy into it is to make it so that black people or people of dark skin are lesser than, are not quite as human as. And it makes it easier for the propaganda for people to believe that. So what happened then, of course, is white people were superior, black people were not. And then when you had enslaved Africans, they were lesser. So people actually believed it was a good thing uh, for black people. And in the US, that has permeated our society. So even after um, uh, enslaved Africans and then Americans that were born into slavery were freed in, um, in the 1800s. Actually, this Friday, by the way, is called Juneteenth. And many organizations are closing their businesses for the first time ever to celebrate it because it wasn't until um, a couple of years that the news got to Texas that slaves were actually free. But my point is that even after slaves were freed, there then became laws, we call them Jim Crow laws, that kept black people as a lower class. So there were white bathrooms, black bathrooms, that kind of thing. Then if you move forward, uh, there were many different protests and riots around race and a race inequity and a lack of equal justice and that type of thing. But the one that most people know around the world was the civil rights movement in the 60s. And I was a teenager then, so I remember it very well. And at that time, then there were laws passed that uh, black people should absolutely be able to vote and not be blocked. And even today, there's still discussions about suppressing uh, voter rights. So it is a very, it's very alive and well. So when we bring, when we come to the present time, 
and Black Lives Matter specifically, uh, around the world I see people carrying those posters. And I think some folks think it's, it's about that organization. It, it isn't really, it's about the words themselves, Black Lives Matter. Now, some folks will say, but don't white lives matter? Of course they do. However, black men in particular, but black men and women get killed much more often by police officers than do white men and women. And so in 2016, uh, when Trayvon Martin, who was a teenager, was murdered by a security officer, Black Lives Matter became, that became the, the, the um, phrase that everyone said and, and an organization was created. So today, Black Lives Matter is an organization that supports equal justice in all ways. So it's not, the organization actually is not even just about black lives. They support transgender, LGBTQ broadly, but specifically transgender, because in our country, the average age of a transgender black woman is 35. So there's much, much work to be done. I know that was a long answer, but I tried, I wanted to try to show the history of it all. You know, I, I realize now that everything that has happened to me to this point, and I am well into my 60s. I'm, I'm comfortable with my age, but I'm well into my 60s. Let's just put it that way. I realize that everything that's happened to me in my life to this point has prepared me for this exact moment, meaning this exact moment in time in my country where I have the skills and abilities to help others see each other as human beings first and then to get in touch with ways that we can be allies and advocates far beyond what we've really talked about in the past. When I was um, born in New Jersey, which is a state just outside of New York, so we always have had an identity problem because there's New York and then, oh, of course, there's New Jersey. <laughs> and so I think as a little kid, I, I always had some sense of people didn't see us equally even though I, of course, was too young to understand it that way. However, growing up in New Jersey, I didn't directly experience racism like people who grew up in the South. My husband was born in the segregated South, so he is very clear in um, seeing Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan members going to their meetings and burning crosses, and then he'd see them the next day without their mask, and he knew exactly who they were. I didn't have that experience, but I did have experiences, particularly as a teenager when I was in high school, where after the fact, I realized that some of my teachers were, we would say, biased these days, you know, were certainly prejudiced as it related to uh, African Americans. So one example to provide context was when I was a junior in high school, so that was the year before I would graduate, I was in my history class, and I loved history for a change. I really didn't, wasn't that interested in it before then, but this teacher really made history interesting. So I loved going to that class. Well, the civil rights movement was in full action, and, and plus riots had happened after Martin Luther King's death. And this teacher said to the class, and I was always the only black per person in my classes except for gym and lunch, it just because of where I lived and the school I was going to. And so here I was, the only black kid in the class, and he said, you know, I do believe that black people should have more rights. Actually, I think back then we were referred to as Afro-American, which is now not appropriate, African-American or black people. But in any case, he said, you know, I think, I think that Afro-Americans do deserve some additional rights, but they need to be patient. Now, he was a white man, my favorite teacher. I didn't have the courage at that moment to say something in front of all of my white classmates. But after class, I went up to him because I was enraged. I don't ever remember being 
that angry at that age. So I went up to him after class and I said, Mr. Allen, when you were born as a white baby, did you have to be patient and wait for your freedom? He didn't say anything, just kind of looked at me, but he had a puzzled look on his face. I think he understood what I was saying. And because he was my favorite teacher, I, I paid attention to his behavior just in general, you know, when we're, when we're assembly or whatever. And over that next year, my senior year, I did see some change. I don't want to take full credit for that. I'm certainly sure it was all the things that were happening in the country, but I believe it was at that moment that I realized something really does need to be done. But clearly, you know, but way back then, there was no such thing as diversity, actually, not the way we use it now. And so uh, when I went to college, I majored in education, essentially, and I taught high school for a couple of years and then got married and moved to another state. I was teaching in Virginia, moved to Michigan, which is in the Midwest and very cold. And then I started working for the business school at the Graduate School of Business at University of Michigan. That's where I was introduced to adults who wanted to learn because I was working in the part of the business school that was the money-making part where uh, managers and executives would come from all over the world to our workshops and seminars. So I wasn't dealing with students and rarely was dealing with uh, faculty actually, because I would hire what we now call professional speakers to speak in those sessions. So I fell in love with wanting to uh, become a speaker in workshops and so forth. So we moved again, we followed my husband's career at the time. So we moved to Philadelphia and uh, then we moved again to Phoenix, Arizona. And so by the time we moved to Arizona, I had decided I wanted to start my own business. Now, when we moved those times, I was always either in training and development, this is what they called it back then, so learning and development uh, in, corporate, in the corporate world, or I was uh, in HR, HR development and organization development. So I, I developed that background before I started my own business, which helped me tremendously. And then um, after starting my business in 1986, I did lots of different types of training because I didn't know what I wanted my expertise to be. And then I had things happen to me, so I knew I needed to do this work. So um, I started dabbling in it in 1991, and then by 1994, I was fully committed. And that's the rest of the story. <laughs> So as a professional speaker, and I use that term intentionally, a lot of people refer to themselves as a public speaker. In my mind, a public speaker is someone who could be terrific, but first of all, do they follow a code of ethics? And in my speaker journey, uh, I was president of the National Speakers Association here in the US, and then was fortunate um, several years later to become um, president of the Global Speakers Federation. So we have speaker associations all over the world. Professional speakers, in my opinion, connect with their association. And even if you don't have one in your country, you can still connect with another one by going to globalspeakers.net, you'll find it, and globalspeakersfederation.net. But in any case, what we can do as speakers because we have the platform to talk to hundreds, and when you put us all together, thousands of people in a year. We can be intentional in our message, whatever our expertise is. It could be IT, it could be customer service, it could be um, inspiration and motivation, but whatever it is, we can reflect that we know the people in our audience by the way we tell our stories, by the graphics we use on our slides. So for instance, uh, one of the things that I share with my speakers when I speak to uh, chapters here in the, in the US 
is I talk to them about how to engage your audience so they feel that you're talking directly to each one of them. And really what I'm giving them are diversity and inclusion tips. And one of the things I say to them is, you know, I know most speakers use quotes, quotations of other people. And what you can do to connect with your audience is to not only use dead white guys. Use quotes from lots of different people, from young people like Malayla, um, from older people, from black people, from white people, you know, just really intentionally use quotes from various people. And if you use um, slides, put the picture of the person as well as their name and the quote, because that way people in your audience are going to say, oh, she gets me. And they won't consciously think that, they just will become more connected to you. As you tell your stories, you own your story. So when you think of the names of the people in your story, you can change the name to be more diverse and inclusive, if it's appropriate. Now, you know, it just depends on what your story is. But every story doesn't have to have a George and a Mary in it. It could have more uh, inclusive and diverse types of names. Additionally, when you're talking in general, it is appropriate to, even if you started out with he or she in a sentence, and especially when you're writing, you can continue what you're saying by saying they. Now, here's the reason why. The way I write is sometimes I will, when I'm making a general statement, I'm not talking about a person, uh, so I'm explaining the situation and I say, and he might, and then in the next sentence, talking about the same thing, I'll say she. Then it may be that I start with she and say what I'm going to say. Then there's a comma and I use they. Now, why would you do that? Because that embraces the LGBTQ uh, plus community. Some people are not he or she. They're on a continuum and they prefer to be referred to as they. And I find that challenging to a lot of people and it's and I'm conscious of it, so it's challenging to me too that I'm really trying to embed that in my language. But my point is, you're never going to get it all right. But if you do a few things, it will show that you're doing what you can to embrace everyone in the audience. And so that's what I mean by doing things that create that space where everyone is 100% human and you're authentic. So you have to do those things in a way that embrace your personality and who you are. That's tough for women and it's tough for people of color because we have been constantly taught to fit in to the European um, culture, so to speak, the white European culture. And so we're constantly thinking, am I saying this right? Am I saying it in a way they would hear me? Oh, how does my hair look? Am I wearing attire that is going to make them comfortable? And some people do that way more than others. I'm, you know, almost 70. So I'm, you know, I've told you my, my age already. I'm almost 70 and I still find myself doing that. I find myself though saying, you know, but nobody can be me as good as I can be me. And if some folks get upset about a few things, so let it be because maybe they will at least be thinking. So we all have to determine what's, what's our risk tolerance. How much do we feel we have to cover? Cover is when we're acting in a way that's not authentic. Um, how much do we find ourselves having to code switch which is talking one way when you're among a lot of people who are different than you and another way when you're at home with people that you're comfortable with. Um, so we all go through that. And during this time right now where racial, racial, racial tension is so high, uh, I think everyone, black people and white people, are thinking about those things. So it's a great time for educating. Thank you so much. That was phenomenal. Thank you, Lenora.